Okay, so in this uh, um, presentation, what we will uh, do is really go a little bit deeper into uh, what parent calling actually is uh, from, from next generation sequencing data and, and what kind of calculations are actually done uh, under the hood because it's a relatively important uh, part of, of, uh, of the parent analysis. So um, what we have done up to now in this, in this workflow is, um, so yesterday and also the first part of today, uh, we have aligned our reads to, to the reference uh, genome, uh, added the, the read groups, it's not uh, in this uh, overview, and uh, marked the, the duplicate. So after the duplicate marking, typically there's a base called the score recalibration, of course, more about that uh, in, in the presentation. And then actually the core, I would say, of, of the variant calling would be, of course, the variant calling uh, itself. And how that works, you'll learn about it in this presentation. My apologies. So it takes your alignment and it tries to uh, turn that uh, into a PCF. So it tries to say, OK, uh, at this position, we really have a homozygous variant. Well, if you look at it, it makes sense for that. And at this position, it has a heterozygous uh, variant. Uh, same calls for, for this uh, insertions and, and deletions. So uh, in order to uh, call variants, uh, we have to uh, answer three uh, important questions. One uh, a very obvious important question is at a certain location, do we see variation in there? Yes or no? Is there a deviation from the reference uh, according to, to the alignment? Second question is, okay, if we decide there is something going on at that particular location, what are the alleles? Um, so uh, of course we have a certain assumption. Um, for example, if a certain organism is, is deployed, um, we can expect uh, two different alleles at a certain location. If your organism is haploid, you have other assumptions. If your organism is, is polyploid, you also have other assumptions, of course. Um, <clears throat> so what are these alleles? Um, and do we have enough evidence that these alleles uh, actually exist? And then as a third uh, question, okay, we have uh, evidence for the existence of, of certain alleles, uh, what is then their, their genotype? Also, um, depending on the, um, <clears throat> on the assumptions we have about the organism, but if we are looking at the diploid, for example, uh, for, for humans, is uh, the position uh, homozygous reference, so basically no uh, deviation uh, from uh, the reference. Is it a heterozygous? or is it homozygous alternative? So different uh, from, from the reference. And we do that by estimating the allele count uh, in, in the sample. So meaning allele counts are the number of reads supporting a certain allele. So uh, haplotype color does that in, in four steps. And it does that all based on the level of the, of the haplotype. So uh, before, I think that would be like 10 or 15 years ago, typically you did, you did that at the level of the individual variant, uh, but um, these, these algorithms have improved in such a way that they take haplotype information in account and therefore the variant estimates uh, have definitely improved. So first it identifies active regions. So it just looks for any deviation uh, with the reference. Then it tries to assemble uh, haplotypes um, and then also uh, gets rid of unlikely uh, haplotypes. So haplotypes we, we should do, do not have to take into account by, by pruning. Then uh, for each read, it uh, tries to um, find a likelihood whether it supports a haplotype, uh, yes or no. So basically then you get kind of counts uh, per haplotype that are supported by the read. And based on these counts, there will be uh, genotypes assigned. So whether 
it is homozygous reference, heterozygous, or homozygous alternative. So to uh, answer the question, uh, what are the alleles? Let's say we have this uh, situation uh, over here. So this is the truth. Um, so we have two chromosomes and we have four variants over there. So at one position, we have homozygous alternative at W position. At the X uh, position, we have uh, heterozygous. At the Y position, we have homozygous reference. And at the Z position, we have uh, also heterozygous. Well, these alleles, they are in repulsion between X and Z. So the alternative alleles are in repulsion. So we uh, can generate reads out of that. Uh, in an ideal world, uh, those reads would be, would give a perfect uh, representation. However, what can, of course, uh, uh, and what you can do uh, from those uh, reads is uh, create a graph. Um, based on the uh, existence of alleles uh, in these reads. So of course, and we connect the alleles in these reads uh, by their, um, uh, whether they are in the same read, uh, yes or no. So in this case, our reads uh, are uh, sequencing all four uh, variants, and that's a very exceptional situation, but for the sake of uh, explanation, uh, this is a nice example. So. Um, at the first position, we always have alternatives. So we start with only an alternative allele. And then we have five reads supporting going from alternative to alternative at position uh, Z. We have five reads supporting going from alternative to um, reference and five reads supporting going from alter, uh, reference to reference. And the same counts for the for other reads. So this is the kind of a uh, perfect uh, perfect graph representing all of the haplotypes uh, in this uh, in this alignment. However, what can also happen is of course uh, is of course sequencing error. Um, for example, at position Y, we might have one um, one allele that's a sequencing error occurring. And then our graph is extended, but we see that this extension of the graph has very, very little support. So we have quite good support along the, this line. We have quite good support along this line, but not very well support along this line because it's only supported by a single read. And what GHK then does is it prunes off those unlikely haplotypes uh, that are supported by only only few or only one one read, and then ends up with the most plausible haplotypes. <clears throat> so then um, what is also an important part of uh, answering the question, what are the alleles, is uh, to say, OK, um, what are the alleles of the indel? And that is not a very easy uh, question to answer, because um, uh, what uh, aligners are are very is very fast software. You saw that you know we had about one hundred fifty thousand reads in the in the exercises, and that performed an alignment on still a pretty pretty large reference. So the entire chromosome twenty in just what was it like thirty seconds or so. So aligners are uh, are very efficient software, but they are so fast because they had to make some, make some choices, and one of those choices is that they um, uh, do not. Uh, do very precise uh, insertion deletion alignment. So it often very much depends on where the insertion deletion ends up in the read, how it is aligned. So typically, if you have a normal alignment, these, uh, in this case, an insertion uh, looks very, very messy. Um, but GHK does, uh, in the process of um, calling variants, it does an indel realignment that basically occurs at this at this haplotype uh, step, where all the indels are nicely realigned and uh, can be called as an actual variant. So now we have the possible when we know that uh, we have information about the the active site. We have information about the possible alleles by making uh, making this graph. Um, and then we have to estimate what the actual genotype will be. So is it heterozygous or is it homozygous? 
And um, that is also um, quite a, a relevant process, I would say, also to, to understand what, what variant calling is about. So let's take the example uh, that at a site we count uh, nine bases. So over there we have a coverage of nine. So we uh, sequence, we have sequenced that site uh, nine times. So this would be the case, right? So we have the aligned read. read. And um, what we see is out of those nine, nine reads, we count four bases to be C. And in this case, it would be the alternative allele and five cases to, to be A. So what you uh, can do is actually calculate a probability that in the case that you sample nine times a certain reference, uh, if you sample nine times the DNA of your uh, of your organism, and you have the assumption that the chance of finding a C or an A is 0.5, that would be the case of heterozygous allele, we can actually calculate the chance um, uh, that for that to happen. So let's say we have the assumption that this um, organism or this individual is heterozygous at that site, then we have the hypothesis, okay, there is a chance that you draw, uh, there's 50% chance that we draw a uh, an A, and there's a 50% chance that we draw a, a C. So P is 0 0.5 for drawing uh, the alternative allele. So the, we can just uh, use a binomial distribution for that, and then the probability that we draw four times a, a C would be 0.25 out of the nine, just by say, okay, there's a 0.5% chance that we draw that piece. Um, if we turn that into an hypothesis, let's say we have the hypothesis that P is 0 0.5, so that's basically the hypothesis, okay, at uh, this uh, site, this organism is heterozygous, uh, it becomes a likelihood. So the likelihood for uh, the hypothesis that P is 0 0.5, so our organism is heterozygous, and we draw four Cs out of nine, that likelihood is 0 0.25. Um, <clears throat> let's say we uh, have uh, a situation, uh, in a, for example, in a different site, where we only draw nine uh, alternative alleles, so nine Cs. So typically, you would say, okay, this is very likely to be a homozygous alternative, because the C is an alternative. So we are we have the hypothesis that P equals one, meaning that every time you draw from that organism, you will draw the alternative allele. Again, you can calculate a, um, a likelihood for that. So we can first test the first hypothesis. So the first hypothesis would be that um, we still have a heterozygous, so this case, and it's still possible that we draw nine times the alternative. So even under uh, the relatively unlikely situation that we have a heterozygous uh, individual, we still have a likelihood that isn't zero, just because it is possible, but it is unlikely, of course. We have a very low likelihood. However, if we take the other hypothesis that we have a homozygous alternative, we have a relatively high likelihood. So we can see that if we have to choose whether in this situation we are uh, we have a heterozygous uh, variant or homozygous variant, we have much higher likely higher likelihood for the homozygous alternative variant, of course. And you can, for example, also compare those likelihoods, for example, with the likelihood ratio, and you see that the likelihood still is much, the likelihood is uh, for a homozygous individual is much higher compared to the um, heterozygous uh, hypothesis. So this is how you can estimate, uh, estimate genotypes, right? So we can test all of those three hypotheses for the different situation. We can even take also probability of zero, so we only have um, uh, reference uh, alleles in our individual, of course, the likelihood will be zero over here because there are no red marbles in here. So there are no 
uh, reference alleles in there. So it's impossible to draw nine uh, alternative alleles in there. Is it all clear? You can use a simple binomial distribution to estimate the, the genotype. And of course, in this, in this situation, uh, it is already quite obvious that this is most likely heterozygous and this is most likely homozygous alternative. However, there are also situations where it, it's less like. So um, in this question I have, uh, I have an example where it's less likely and for you is the, the question to you is, okay, what do you think should be the genotype? So share my browser screen. So what you can do is go to vvox.app and enter this, this number or scan the QR code. And then the question is, we have again, we are sequencing a certain site nine times again, but instead of about 50-50, we have eight basis reference and one basis alternative. So basically eight, eight and one C. What is, uh, what would you consider to be at that site to be the most likely genotype? Okay, I think most of you have answered. So I'll stop. So 50-50, good. Okay, so most of you said, okay, it's probably homozygous reference because by far most of the base are, are reference. And some of you said it's heterozygous because having one base supporting an alternative gives evidence that there is an alternative allele. I would agree with, with both of you, especially if we assume this binomial distribution. And this binomial distribution, of course, doesn't take error into account at all. So let's have a look at that uh, situation. So um, again, uh, this is a visual representation uh, of, of the question we just had. So we sequence the site nine times and we have eight reference allele and one alternative allele. So in principle, what you would say, just by looking at it, okay, the C is probably an error. So we're going to test the hypothesis that we are working with a homozygous reference. So that would be testing the hypothesis P equals zero, but we find one uh, alternative. And just by taking a strict binomial distribution, that likelihood will be completely zero because it is impossible to draw a red marble out of a jar of only green marbles, of course. So um, the most to the, the, the solution that seems most likely to most of you actually by with binomial distribution would give a chance of zero. Well, the highest likelihood would be the case where we have uh, a probability of 0 0.5 because over there it is possible. Although the likelihood is relatively small, it is the highest likelihood because also P equals 1 would be completely impossible because um, also in P equals 1 we only have red marbles, so only C's in there. So we cannot work with this strict binomial distribution. We have to do uh, something else that takes error into account. And that's why base quality is such an important parameter in um, variant calling. So uh, although these base qualities are, are very high nowadays, so typically if you sequence an um, Illumina library, you get base qualities over 30. It's, uh, often it's more than 90% of the base, so I have a base quality over 30. And that means really, really high accuracy. So more than 99.9% uh, accuracy. But still, it means that we, that we can expect error in our data set. So for example, if you have a base quality of 20, which is also re reasonably high, so 99% accuracy. So if you take a, a random base, it will be 99% sure it's the correct base. But still, 1% of those bases are incorrect. So let's say if you have uh, 100 samples uh, and you look at a certain site, and all of them have 40x coverage, at that particular site only, you already expect uh, 40 errors. 
So these errors, they occur quite frequently, even if you have by very high base quality. So even though we have high base qualities, we have been sequencing very accurately, we have to take it into account. And we can do that with this uh, simplified model, uh, at least, well, this is the model that was used uh, at first when uh, people really start working on variant analysis in next generation sequencing data. Um, basically, what it takes into account is um, it tests for a certain uh, genotype. So zero would be homozygous reference, one would be heterozygous, two would be uh, homozygous alternative. Takes the ploidy into account. Well, it is often two if you're looking at uh, human. And then an important one, it takes the base error into account and takes the base error into account of that particular base in every read. So the individual basic in every read. <clears throat> and then of course, the number of bases at the site and the number of bases that, that equal the reference. So basically the count, right? Uh, and from uh, that information, you calculate a, a certain likelihood uh, that actually can take the base error or the base quality uh, into account. Martin, that's a question. Yes, sorry, I don't understand the genotype 0, 1, or 2. How can it be 0? And uh... <laughs> Okay, so genotype, genotype 0 means uh, homozygous reference. So, so it's this, the whole, okay, it's a code or something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's actually very common uh, to use uh, this this uh, notation. Okay, uh, thanks. So it's it's an it's a it's a relevant one to uh, keep in mind. So zero uh, often means or almost always means homozygous reference. So we're looking at, at uh, one side at a time over here, right? So at one mm -hmm. side at a particular active region. If you count zero, uh, alternatively, it will be homozygous uh, reference. One would be heterozygous, and uh, two would be homozygous. So it's basically counting the alternative alleles. Yeah. So could you adjust this if you have like a triploid organism or something like that? Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's a, it's the same way. You're you're counting the alternative alleles. So let's say if you have a, if you have a triploid or or a tetraploid, uh, then the ploidy of course would be four. Mm. And zero would again be homozygous uh, reference. One would be uh, simplex, uh, two would be duplex, three would be triplex, okay. four would be quadruplex. Yes, okay, uh, so uh, we can apply this model, uh, of course, uh, to uh, to our uh, example we just had. <clears throat> And let's say, uh, so we, we still stick with our example. So we have, have eight reference alleles and one alternative allele. And let's uh, make it a bit easier by saying, okay, we have equal base qualities for each of the bases we have been sequencing. And we can calculate likelihoods for the different hypotheses. So homozygous reference, so with genotype zero, we can have a likelihood. For heterozygous, we can have a likelihood. Likelihood and homozygous alternative, we can have a likelihood. So this homozygous alternative is uh, very unlikely that would mean that we may have made eight mistakes by estimating the reference allele and only one to be uh, alternative or correct. So it probably is between those two guys, homozygous reference and heterozygous. So most of you said it's homozygous reference. And indeed, by taking the error into account, so base quality of 20 or an error or 0 0.01, the likelihood would be 0 0.092. And the heterozygous uh, uh, hypothesis, the likelihood would be 0 0.002. Um, like many uh, uh, probabilities in bioinformatics, uh, this can be uh, recalculated as a threat based score, like we do with mapping quality, like we do with base quality. So again, we can uh, recalculate this uh, likelihood to a threat based score, which means that if you get a high number, the probability is low. So in this case, homozygous reference gets a threat based likelihood of 20 and heterozygous gets a threat based likelihood of 27. And in this case, we're looking for the highest likelihood, right? So the lowest threat based likelihood. So if we have to select the most likely genotype, that would be the one with the highest likelihood and the lowest threat based 
like you. So based on an error probability of 0 0.01 uh, for each observation, in the case we have eight reference alleles and one alternative alleles, it's most likely that we have a homozygous reference at this site. So the lowest reference likelihood is the most likely genotype. So it's likely that we have just all reference at that site. So this one. <clears throat> and we can actually um, get a genotype quality out of these numbers. So genotype quality is basically how sure you are that the genotype you are calling is the actual genotype. So, and that is the difference between the most likely genotype and the second most likely genotype. And that's very often how you work with, with likelihoods. You compare the most likely one to the second most likely one in order to get a confidence about how uh, well you picked the right, um, the, the right estimate. So, uh, and that's a very simple calculation. You just take the second lowest spread-based likelihood, which would be the heterozygous one, and you subtract it with the lowest spread based likelihood, which would be the homozygous reference one. So we have 27 minus 20 equals 7. And that will be just the genotype quality. So that is the estimate, um, whether the, uh, the estimate of probability, um, whether you are actually um, having a uh, wrong genotype. So uh, in this case, we can calculate that back because again, it's in the threat based score. So the probability that we have a genotype error would be the inverse of the threat based likelihood. It looks like this. So we have a 20% chance that we're estimating this genotype incorrectly. So this, uh, with this, what I, what I show is that uh, we take the error into account we estimate the most likely genotype and we estimate the probability that we're actually estimating the wrong genotype. So ideally, the difference between homozygous reference and the heterozygous in this case would be as high as possible to have a high as possible genotype quality. Question for you. So just, just to check whether uh, the message came across. So for a variance, we find three threat based likelihoods, 80, 57, and 300. For the genotypes, homozygous reference, heterozygous, and homozygous alternative, respectively. What is the most likely genotype? And what is the most, what is the genotype quality? Okay, I think. Oh, most of you have answered by now. Don't worry too much. Of course, I will explain it later on. Okay, I will stop. Very nice. Oh, most of you were correct. Uh, well done. So indeed, so if we um, remember uh, the last slide well, what you, if you, you have a threat based likelihood, and um, we are looking for the highest likelihood, and the highest likelihood will result in the lowest threat based likelihood. So, if we want to find the genotype with the highest likelihood, we are looking for the lowest threat based likelihood. So, in this case, it would be 57. And that uh, corresponds to a heterozygous genotype. So we're going to estimate this, that this um, uh, individual is, is heterozygous at our site. And then uh, the genotype quality, that is the second lowest threat based likelihood minus the lowest threat based likelihood. So we take the second lowest, which is homozygous reference with 80, and the lowest one, which would be the heterozygous one, 57. So 80 minus 57 is 23. So we estimated the heterozygous genotype and the genotype quality is, is 23. Okay, so you can 
also put this in a graph, uh, for example, where uh, you quite nicely can see that if you are in um, uh, in 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 uh, let's say um, in in fractions of reads having uh, a certain uh, allele, where you are uh, when your yourself would doubt also this model would doubt. So over here on the x-axis we have um, let's say the number of uh, alternative uh, alleles and then the genotype uh, quality. So let's say we count four alternative alleles, then the estimated genotype on the other axis, by the way, the estimated genotype would be one, so heterozygous, and the genotype quality would be high. If you are in regions that would make you doubt, for example, we have eight out of nine to be alternative, we have low genotype quality, and in this case, we estimate it to be a uh, homozygous uh, alternative genotype. So these base qualities, they are important, right? Uh, we very much rely on those base qualities to, to uh, estimate uh, the genotype, for example, and also to estimate these, these haplotypes. So uh, they are uh, important. However, um, the, um, the software provided by Illumina looks at each base individually. And actually the base quality can, the base quality estimate can be very much dependent on the context. So typically if you find a homopolymer, meaning for example, four A's in a row, the base quality is often uh, overestimated, meaning that you have to correct this base quality if you have a set of homopolymers, for example, in your read. So this estimated error rate by uh, the Illumina software uh, is not the real error rate. So therefore, uh, it helps if we do some base quality score recalibration um, on our existing, existing base quality scores. So, um, um, what base quality score recalibration does is, let's say you have a set uh, of, of bases um, that are, are sequenced and a certain base quality score is reported, then the actual uh, empirical quality score, meaning that uh, if you uh, have if you're sequencing a known sequence, you actually can calculate the empirical base quality is usually uh, actually higher than that. So the base quality score in this case is in many cases underestimated. What base quality score recalibration does, it creates a model based on uh, context uh, of those, those bases and try to correct those. And then the empirical base quality and the report base quality so that the corrected base qualities should correspond uh, to each other. And this, uh, this model that is created depends very much, for example, on the lane, on the sample, on the library. And therefore, you have to specify these individual uh, lanes at the individual lane level in uh, the, the read groups. Is this uh, all clear regarding genotype estimation and, and, and base qualities? If so, that's great. So after we run haplotype color, um, we uh, get an output that is um, a very important output, of course, for, for variant analysis, and that is uh, the VCF. The VCF is like uh, many um, uh, file format in bioinformatics. It has a header, and after the header, it is just a dot delimited file. So as you remember from, or from, for example, a BOM file, the header started all with at, um, but for VCF, it starts with a hash, or actually two hashes, and then the, the, the header line uh, for the tab delimited part starts with one hash, as you can see over here, with the, starting with Chrome, and then we have a, a tab uh, delimited file, in this case, depicting three variant sites uh, with, with variant information. So it contains the, the position and the chromosome, 
some information about the reference and alternative value, more about it later, and the genotype information for the individual samples, if you have more than one sample in your VCF. So in this case, I have included father and mother in there. Giancarlo's question. Yes, um, since we are pretty much manipulating VCF files a lot, I was wondering from your experience, what would you recommend as a VCF validator tool? It's, just, it's a little bit out of scope from what we're looking at now, but um, it just popped up in my mind. So I thought mm -hmm. I'd ask, because we have some, but I'm not quite sure whether they are the best or what, what are your recommendations on that? Mm, no, I'm not completely. So what you mean with validation is um, whether uh, all of the formats correspond to each other. So you yes, do not have... VCF format, whether a VCF you get adheres to the VCF specifications. No, I, I wouldn't know. No, um, I also didn't do that very often, so okay. I can't really help you with that. Sorry, no I also have to Google. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, we have some, you know, that's it. Was, I was okay, just okay. wondering from, 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 the, 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 from the actual bench work if somebody has a hint i would be grateful yeah we so can if somebody if somebody knows uh can also write it on slack so it's easy to and with a link or so so it's easy to, to find find that thing okay so um <clears throat> this vcf format is, is 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 a very specific uh format and it's not really made for for humans to read um because um you have to go uh, a lot back and forth in the in in the in the file. Uh, of course, uh, for computers, uh, it is a very uh, efficient way of of storing variant information because it is a super flexible uh, file format. Um, so, um, uh, in the header, uh, there is information about what is and what can be depicted in the depth delimited part of the VCF. Um, so let me first explain first, uh, what are they six, uh, columns in the VCF. So, um, as I said before, we have a position, so chromosome and, and, and base, uh, position of the variant, uh, that is, uh, specified in a certain line. Um, we have, can specify an identifier for that, uh, specific variant. Uh, could be a dbSNP identifier, for example. Then there is the reference allele specified, so the allele you will find in your reference genome, and the alternative allele is specified. And of course, it could also be multiple alternative alleles. In this case, it's only one alternative, so we have a biallelic variant, biallelic SNP in this case. Then there's a quality score for the entire variant, so how sure the variant polar was that at this position was a variant or was not a variant. Then <clears throat> we have the, the filter column. Uh, over here, the filter column is empty. We see only dots, but we can specify whether we uh, filter out the variant, yes or no. So in this case, uh, it can be anything, but in this case, we can have two ways of filtering, either by low quality, so low uh, variant quality, or uh, if we pass it, we specify pass over here. In this case, we don't spe haven't specified any, applied any filters, so there's nothing here, but if we do apply filters, it's specified over there. And that's actually something that's very frequently used um, if, if you work with VCF files. Then the info column, gives us general information about the variant as a whole. So we do not look at the individual genotypes, at the individual samples, but about variant as a whole in the entire cohort. Um, and that's a um, semicolon uh, separated set of um, information. And what those abbreviations in uh, the semicolon separated column actually mean is specified in the header. So for example, we have AC over here. And if you want to know what AC is, we can look it up and we see allele count and genotypes for each alternative allele in the same order list. So apparently we have an allele count of one 
for the alternative allele. Then we have AF, meaning allele frequency, AN, meaning, uh, we also have to look it up, total number of alleles in the cold genotype. So how many alleles did we call? It says six over here, and that is because Sun was also in here, but uh, just for, for simplicity, I, I got it up. So we have actually six in here. And DP means the approximate read depth, so the total depth of the, of the read. Uh, so this is general information about the variants. Then a format field contains specific information about the individual uh, genotype. So it very often starts with DT. And does, what does DT mean? You can look it up over here in the, in the header again. GT means genotype. So that is actually the information whether um, an individual is homozygous reference, uh, heterozygous, or homozygous alternative. And it is specified in a rather special way. Um, it specifies information about the first uh, uh, allele and the second allele. And then a one would be the alternative allele and a zero would be the uh, reference allele. So zero one in this case means heterozygous, zero zero in this case means homozygous reference. Then we have AD. AD means uh, allele frequency, for each alternative allele. Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, AD over here. So AD is also present, no, it's not correct. AD is uh, allelic depth of the reference and the alternative allele. So that cannot be very uh, nice to look at. So in this case, apparently you have a depth of this um, individual of eight, and we find three reference and five alternatives. And that's why it is estimated to be heterozygous. In this individual, we have a very low coverage of only two, and we find only two uh, reference alleles. So that's why it's estimated to be homozygous. Cora has a question. Sorry, so in the info field, I see 15 for the depth, no? Yes. And then here it's the eight. So what is the difference between these? So two? that would be the total depth because it's for the entire uh, entire variant. So for for all of the for the entire cohort, so it will be the depth in the entire cohort. So actually, how many reads actually supporting the existence of a, a variant uh, in the entire cohort? So and at Father apparently we have eight depth of eight. You can also get actually get it from this this DP over here. So we have a depth of eight, three plus five. Mother, you have a depth of two, that is uh, 10. And as I said, there was also a column with sun, but I didn't include it over here because otherwise the, the font would have been too small. So apparently- Okay, so there would be the sun here five. and the sun would have, okay, okay. Indeed, indeed. that's exactly how it, how it works. Okay, um, then um, we have, so DP we have already seen, so that uh, the total depth in that particular individual. Then we have GQ, standing for genotype quality. You can see it over here, genotype quality. And that's that thing we just estimated, right? So that is this lowest, uh, second lowest spread base quality minus the lowest spread base quality. Apparently over here it's 58 because the second lowest spread base quality is 58 and the lowest spread base quality is zero. So 58 minus zero would be genotype quality of 58. So these spread base qualities, they are also specified that you have said that in the last column in this case, CL. So we have 143 for homozygous reference, zero for heterozygous, and 58 for uh, homozygous alternative. So the most likely possibility would be heterozygous, and the second most likely would be homozygous alternative. Same, we can also have a look for the mother, which has very low coverage, right? So we only have a genotype quality of six, which is a very low genotype quality. And that is just because um, it is also very well possible that you're looking at a heterozygous at the position. Okay. That is about VCF. Is that all clear to you? So that is how you can manually read uh, a VCF. Uh, you can check uh, what kind of information can be stored 
uh, in the info, so general information in the format field about uh, specific uh, individuals, specific samples. Um, the PCF format is super flexible, meaning there, there are actually no standards about what can be stored in the info and format field uh, or in the filter field. So you can store any kind of information in both the info and, and format field. However, uh, typically, for example, FreeBase and JTK use uh, very uh, similar abbreviations, meaning meaning the same thing. So there is some consensus on it, but in principle, you could store any kind of information about the individual variant and the the genotypes of the of the of the samples uh, in the info and format field. So if we uh, look at some, some uh, more extensive examples of how um, uh, things are stored in a, uh, in a VCF. So for example, if we look at uh, insertions, deletions, so indels, um, uh, let's say over here. So the, uh, the reference value in this case would be uh, GTC. And we have two alternatives. So either it's a G, uh, so we lose the T and the C, or it is GCT, so we add a T over here. Um, so um, if we then look at the genotypes of, of, the, of the individuals over here, so we have the columns over here. So in this case, we have a heterozygous, and in uh, the second case, we also have heterozygous. But the first individual was heterozygous GTC, as a reference value and then G as an alternative. Well, the second one was GTC also as a reference uh, as a first value, but GTCT as an alternative. So an other alternative value. And that's how multi-allelic uh, variants can be stored in a uh, VCF file. And can be uh, basically uh, whatever number of alternative alleles uh, that is supported by your, uh, by your uh, cohort. Then there's other information that can be stored in the PCF, and those are hap that's haplotype information. Um, so you have seen these um, slashes that separate the uh, different um, alleles, but you can also have pipe symbols separating different alleles. And a pipe symbol specified that the alleles are fake. To each other, so we have haplo. We can also store haplotype information uh, in the in the VCF. So that means that uh, in this case, you need some additional information to which variants are fake to each other. But let's say the, all of those four variants are fake to each other. That we have in in this individual, individual one, we have haplotype of zero zero one zero and the haplotype of zero zero two zero, and we have two different haplotypes in the second individual of 10201 and 0110. So if you have these selected, um, there is no information about phasing. So you do not know where in which to which haplotype these individual alleles belong. But if you have pipes, uh, you do have that information. Question for you. Uh, the question for you is, so now we have learned about VCF files, uh, which information cannot be stored in a VCF file? So we learned it's very flexible and you can store a lot of different information in there, but which information cannot be stored? Okay, I'll stop. Very nice. So all of you... Uh, I have a pretty good idea of uh, what what at least can be stored in VTF file. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, haplotype and phasing information can be stored. That's what we, we just discussed with these uh, with five symbols. If you need the sequence surrounding the variant, so only only variant information is stored. The reference allele is stored, um, and the sequence of that reference allele and alter the sequence of the alternative allele is stored, but nothing, no information of the sequence surrounding the, the variant. So uh, typically, if you do downstream analysis with uh, VCF, uh, you also have to provide the, rep the, the reference genome uh, in order to get information uh, surrounding uh, the, the different variants. Martin has a question. 
Yes, um, I'm not really very clear on the phasing. So this uh, alternative, uh, alternatives for a particular haplotype or something like that, or? Uh, no, these are the, are the haplotypes. So phasing is actually the the construction of haplotypes. Okay, all right. I will have more about that in the in the coming slide. Michael has a question. Uh, maybe can you go back to that other VC file, VC file that you were showing? Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, here. Uh, so uh, the last slide where you have this reference, I mean, it's GTC, which kind of alternative either G or GTCT. So that's technically like a small indel. Is it understand correctly? Yeah. 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 Okay. Indeed. So this is this is really how, how an indel is represented in a VCF. So we have a, uh, either the, an, an alternatively with a deletion compared to the reference, and we have an allele with an insertion compared to the reference. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, just following up, you mentioned that the VCF file is super flexible. So in mm -hmm. principle, you can annotate things you like, put in your gene names and whatnot, I guess. <laughs> so in principle, you could also like add like uh, the sequence of which surrounds a particular snippet. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes, you can. Um, um, is this considered bad uh, practice, I guess? Or... Um, well, uh... I would say so uh, because, um, well, really storing uh, the the reference uh, sequence, uh, it well, just PTF is is not the place to store it, so it's probably best uh, to to store a reference information in FASTA file. Mm -hmm. However, um, sometimes you actually want to store a non-variant uh, region information about non-variant regions in your PTF, and more about that in the coming slide. It is a nice bridge. Mm -hmm. I would say. Yes. I also okay. was wondering, actually, uh, I'm, I didn't try this myself yet, but uh, sometimes uh, genome browsers like the EBI may allow you to upload files, isn't it? Like VCF files, I'm sure of mm -hmm. it. And then probably they, they obviously need to fulfill the standard, which we were like already discussing a little bit, I guess. <laughs> um, well, not not entirely. So usually these these uh, these are quite flexible. So what we will do uh, in the um, in the exercise on visualization is actually we will load a VCF uh, in uh, IGV, and then you will there you will see what kind of information IGV uses to to visualize uh, these these variants. Okay, cheers. Okay, so uh, let's say we have a certain uh, situation. To uh, we have two samples. Uh, so these are the the, the truths. So we do not know them beforehand because we are going to sequence those, those two, two samples. So we have nice based information again, uh, three variants, um, and, and in total also four different haplotypes. So we have haplotype one over here, haplotype two over here, third haplotype over here, and fourth haplotype over here. So um, we have sequenced them and we did variant calling. Variant calling went, went very well because we have a good representation of what is present, for example, in, in sample, sample one. Um, so um, we have their positions, and we, we see that uh, at position X, we have a homozygous alternative in sample one, and position Y, we have a heterozygous in sample one, and we have nicely phased them, right? So you can see that we have the haplotype over here, the orange haplotype corresponding over here to in the VCF and the one zero haplotype corresponding with the purple over here in the VCF. We didn't do anything with position Z because it's homozygous reference. And you know, if there is no variant over there, there we are also not going to call it if we do the variant calling on the individual sample. Sample two uh, would look like this. Again, we nicely have called the genotypes correctly. Um, we have also uh, uh, have phasing information. So we have phased uh, the, let's say, the, the orange uh, haplotype as well, 0, 1, 1, and, the per and a purple haplotype as well, 1, 0, 1. So the third and the fourth 
haplotype were also identified. So that's how, how it would look like. So then uh, at some point, we want to combine those PTF into a cohort. Maybe we want to use that PTF, for example, a genome-wide association study. And then um, we find ourselves having some issues there because in sample one, uh, we did not have any information about site Z because it was not different from the reference. And therefore, we're also not going to call variants over there. So we're missing information over there. Uh, we do know that there is a variant at that position because we call a variant in, in sample two. So what should we do there? And that's the question I have for you. <clears throat> so what would be the solution you think for this missing genotype problem? So we have a missing genotype in uh, sample one just because it was homozygous reference. There's no good or wrong, by the way, over here. It's just uh, what do you what do you think is the best solution? Right or wrong? Okay, I think most of you have answered. I will stop. Ooh. We have uh, almost a tie. Yeah, cool. This also very much, of course, refers to, to Martin's question. So um, all three solutions um, could work, are valid, I would say. I think the third uh, solution is a bit of a pity uh, if you fill out missing values uh, over there um, because we just, we have that information, right? We have sequenced that position in sample one. So we do have information whether um, if we would have no sequence over there, uh, of course, that would be a missing value, but we have sequences. So we're pretty sure it is really a homozygous reference. So adding a missing value over there would be a bit of a pity. Um, so I would say that leaves us uh, with, with the other two. So we could do a variant call on all samples in one go. Um, that is definitely a, a valid way to look at it. However, if we have a large cohort, so nowadays, sometimes cohorts uh, have more than 10,000 uh, samples. If you want to do the variant analysis in one go, we need massive computational resources, right? So we have huge, huge, huge spawn files. Um, and we have to do uh, that variant call in, in one go. And also, if we decide we are going to add samples to our cohort, so we are going to add maybe 100 samples, we would have to redo the variant calling entirely uh, with all the samples together. So again, huge computational effort. Another way would be to store information on non-variant regions in the, in the TCF. So um, not necessarily the sequence of those regions, but the quality of those regions. So for example, what their coverage was and what kind of base qualities we, we got over there. Because then we know, okay, we have sequenced that region and we didn't find a variant, so it should be homozygous reference. Um, the first solution is the solution that, uh, for example, uh, uh, most uh, variant colors have that have been around for a while. For example, uh, Freebase, uh, which uh, the developers of Freebase would suggest uh, that as the best uh, solution. Well, uh, nowadays, more and more, more, it goes into the direction of the solution that was proposed by the GATK developers, which would be doing a variant call on the individual uh, samples, but then store non-variant information in the VCF. <clears throat> so this is just a summary of what I just said. So most variant uh, colors uh, genotype all samples in one go, but it becomes computation intensive. And if you have a new sample, you have to redo the entire variant call. And then G8K and, and more and more variant colors nowadays, uh, they support uh, DPCFs. And the DPCFs is a specific type of PCF that can store information about non variant regions. Um, we will have a look at this DPCFs uh, in the exercises. Um, and then you will also see a bit how it's stored. Basically, 
stores information about regions and their quality. So that is basically uh, their coverage and their, their base quality, their average base quality. So then some information about other software. Um, in this course, we uh, practically we are using uh, GATK a lot, but of course GATK is not the only software that can be used for hypertyping and that there is also additional software uh, you can use, for example, to work with TCF. Uh, here are just a few uh, examples. Uh, Freebase is, I think, the most frequently used alternative to, to GATK. Big advantage of Freebase is that it's relatively straightforward to use. It's, basically a simple, uh, a single uh, command with a lot of options, of course, but it's relatively straightforward. Nowadays, it also can produce, uh, nowadays it also can produce DPCF. Uh, I would say it's a good alternative, uh, especially if you do variant call, it can help to uh, use multiple variant uh, callers, um, and then typically people use Freebase as an alternative to PATK. If you uh, are uh, working with PCFs in general, uh, combining them, um, uh, I don't know, filtering them and so on, uh, there are many things you can do with a PCF. There are two tools that are frequently used, uh, BCF tools um, that is uh, developed by the same people that developed the SUM tool. Um, and then we have uh, VCF tools um, with similar functionality to BCF tools, but just an alternative. If you want to uh, do a real haplotype assembly, so the haplotype information that is provided by GHK is relatively limited. If you really want to do haplotype assembly out of short reads or long reads, uh, then I would suggest you to have a look at what's hap. Um, it's a lot of nice functionality and it's basically the most frequently software for, for haplotype assembly. Uh, also, as an alternative that is becoming more and more popular um, to uh, compare to JTK and Freebase, it's Deep Variant. Uh, Deep Variant is developed by by Google, and it performs uh, it's based on deep learning, and it performs variant calling in both short uh, and and long reads. Uh, so I think typically the first um, program you would like to use if you are Following variants for Oxford, from Oxford nanopore technology data, then uh, the variant would be uh, one uh, variant caller to, to look into. And of course, this list is very long. This is just a representation of tools, at least I have been using uh, um, quite often, uh, but there are many more. So to um, um, to show you where we are uh, in the so uh, in the, in the whole process of of the exercises, so yesterday we uh, uh, and and part of today we managed to um, prepare the bomb files uh, for uh, base quality score recalibration. So we have the duplicate mark, duplicates mark, um, and we have the read groups added. So in the next exercise, what you will do is actually perform the base quality score recalibration. For base quality score recalibration, it's important to realize that you always need a reference set of variants because um, it will ignore sites that are that are variable, um, and, and so that's that's quite important. For human data, uh, that's usually not really an issue uh, to to get uh, existing var variant data. So for uh, for existing variant sites, for other organisms, that can be uh, a bigger ch challenge. So for example, for dog and for cow, there are resources available, uh, but for, for many other um, mammals, there isn't. Um, for, for a lot of plants, there also isn't. Uh, this information isn't available. However, uh, what, what you typically can do is first do a variant call without base quality score recalibration, then take that variant call and use it as input for base quality score recalibration and then continue with the variant polling uh, again. In the exercise, we are working with human data. So we're in that sense, we're lucky. So we have existing uh, variant uh, information that we can use as input for base quality score recalibration. After base quality score recalibration, we will do a the, the variant uh, calling um, and then for each sample, we will have an individual VCF. So that will be this a G VCF that stores um, uh, information about non-variant non regions. 
And then we make a database out of these VCF, VCFs and then we extract a VCF, a regular VCF with the entire cohort out of it. So with all the individual samples, and in our case, it's only three, but you can imagine those cohorts can be pretty large. 